Hey, Mick, it's Dennis from the Australian Rock Show. How are you? Uh, good, Dennis. How are you, buddy? Look, I'm very, very well. Mate, we do want to talk about your current bands, but I also want to go back through the time tunnel and talk about some of your earlier bands, and there's quite a history there. But before we get into that, I just wanted to say congratulations on the recent Rose Carlio um, release, Battle Scars. Terrific EP, and part of that can be attributed to your powerhouse drumming and also the combination you have with bass player Steve King. Yes, mate. Yeah, no, thanks for that, mate. No, we're, we're all pretty chuffed with it. Um, the the band sort of came, I'm not sure if you know the, the full rundown, but um, Rose, as you probably know, came over from the country scene and um, she wanted to get away from that because she wasn't having much success there. And um, she came to a gig that I was playing with with, with uh, Stephen King, Kingy, uh, with Lucy DeSoto and the Handsome Devils and uh, said to Mick, geez, I'd love to have these guys as a rhythm section. And Mick said, well, why don't you ask them? Uh, and that's pretty much how it happened. So, um, yeah, we we said yes, of course. And, you know, we've been at it now for about oh, 18 months, I guess, two years. Mm. And um, have written the EP, as you, as you know, and, and well-reviewed, which we thank you for as well. Oh, very welcome, very welcome. So the, the Rose Carlier Band have been out and about doing some shows in support of Battle Scars with more shows booked. How have those shows been going? Yep. Yeah, not too bad, mate. Um, you know, it's, unfortunately, the scene is not, not like what we, we're used to from, you know, like the 80s and early 90s. But um, we're out there trying to do our bit, mate. It's just, uh, you know, it's what we do. I mean, as we all know, there's not a hell of a lot of money in it, but we love doing what we do and... Hopefully uh, people get on board and, and come and see us and, and buy the EP, which seems to be happening, which is great. Well, those, uh, just further to that, those who have heard Battle Scars seem to really, really like it. And I guess it's a case of momentum slowly building, isn't it? Yes, that's right, Dennis. As you know, it, um, it's not easy out there. Um, you just got to chip away at it. But um, we've had, you know, obviously like yourself and a few others, um, giving us great praise for what we've done. And um, a few uh, journalists reviewing and, and giving us great rapport for that as well. So, yeah, mate, it, we're, we're doing what we can, but we're we're, we're hopeful that um, it'll get bigger and better as time goes on. Okay, and in recent times, you've also been playing out with uh, Chris Brockbank's band Phantom Mark Five, Newcastle's Bounty Hunters, which is David and Lynn Hines' band, and you also sat in with Harry Bruce. You also gig with Swanee, Chris Turner and the Cavemen, Lucy DeSoto and the Handsome Devils, to name but a few. I remember many years back, I read a quote from, um, I think it was Eric Singer, who, before he found a permanent gig with Kiss, he said he felt like a bit of a, a gun for hire. Is that how you feel at times? Are you happy to take the opportunities when they arise and play out whenever there is an opportunity? Most definitely. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful and, and uh, happy of, for you know anything I've done in the past, and um, as as we know, you know you've just got to keep keep doing it, and especially if we love it, well, then it makes it a little bit easier as well. So, yeah, I'm I'm quite fortunate and been very lucky over the years to play with you know some of the greats. So, playing with so many different bands, do you find you have to adjust your style to suit the different bands you're playing with, and, and is that an easy thing to do? So, some some of the the music, yes, definitely. I mean, some of the stuff, some. Um, either middle of the road or um you know with chris turner it's it's a little bit more bluesy mm. um blues boogie so um yeah i've got to adjust the, the the volume throttle if you like um but yeah that took me a long time to actually get my head around to be honest um i was always known to be a, a big hitter and um there was lots of gigs that i would have loved to have done but didn't get the opportunity probably because of, of that tag being you know one of the the, the hardest hitters around so mm. um it took me a long time to uh discipline myself which I've, I've done now and and you know it's all paying off and i still love to get out there and thump away as you know you were also playing uh with king in a band called stand alone what what happened to that project that was yeah that was that was um that band sort of um enigmated from a, a band called thug uh, and that sort of dissolved, and um, the lineup of that band, which was uh, Mick Arnold on guitar and, and Chumley on vocals, um, we ended up getting another guitar player with um, um, Anthony Hoffman, who used to play with, uh, I forget now who he used to play with, um, but all great players. Um, it was it was just a loud and obnoxious pub rock band. Mm. Um, it, 
it sort of had its own sort of postcode, if you like, and, and it wasn't intentional. It just happened that way from the first rehearsal. Unfortunately, um, you know, we, uh, we're all doing different things and um, it just sort of dissolved because things were getting a little bit too hard and, um, you know, family commitments, blah, 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 blah. Sure, so sure, sure. pretty much just put an end to that band, which was a shame. So, But, you know, we move on as we do. Okay, so I want to go back a bit, if I may, and look at your formative years. How old were you when you started playing drums, and was it always the drums for you? Pretty much, mate, yeah. I, again, I, I started fairly late in life it, 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 as far as, you know, like players concerned. But um, I think I started when I was about 14, 15, and it, it happened so that the next-door neighbour was a drummer, and they used to have, you know, rehearsals in the house, and I used to go and listen and... Uh, I was lucky enough that uh, he gave me his first drum kit and that sort of sent me off. And obviously my parents had a big input in saying, well, if you're going to do this, you're going to do it properly. So I had, um, you know, formal lessons and, and that was it pretty much. I was hooked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of drummers, particularly those guys in the 60s and early 70s, were, were influenced by jazz and big band drummers like Gene Krupa. Uh, I'm yep. assuming all your influences were rock drummers, you know, Phil Rudd and, yeah. and that kind of thing? Well, you just hit Gene Cooper on the head, mate. That was one of the first books that um, I was okay. given uh, when I was having formal lessons. And obviously, you know, it, it um, crossed over to, um, you know, when I was growing up, I'd listen to Zeppelin, of course, Bonham, uh, Ian Pace, Deep Purple, anything anything that, that sounded great and anything that was a bit of a challenge, I just, I just hooked onto it, you know. Mm. Um, over the years, you know, as you, as you grow as a player, I, I um, you know, even got into some of the, the, the sort of MOR type stuff with Toto and, mm. and things like that. So that obviously set me in good stead. I want you to fill in a couple of gaps for me, please. So you rose to prominence with Judge Mercy, 1991 from Emmy. Were you in any other bands before that? That's correct, mate. Um, before that, I was playing with Swanee. I, I pretty much, I, and I still do play with John uh, Swanee. Mm. Um, obviously it's not as much these days. It's, um, it's very sporadic, but, um, um, I started playing with John in about 87, um, and the same with Chris Turner. Uh, not long after that, I played with, uh, Alex Smith, um, Alex and moving pictures had part of ways and he, he, uh, started a solo career and I was fortunate enough to, uh, be a part of that as well. So, and that sort of set me in good stead from there, really. I understand that um, and I'll, Tim. Some, I think it was Tim Polds who who recorded the um, the early Judge Mercy demos. Was he ever in the frame? That's correct. Yeah. F- for the gig or rather, uh, no, not at all. The funny funny thing there was um, I was working at Billy Hyde's in Leichhardt, which was the you know the the renowned drum store. Mm, mm. And Tim Tim had come in, and uh, Tim said to me, he said, Nick, he said, I've got this gig that you should audition for. He said the auditions are now. He said he's. He said, I would get onto it straight away. He said, but it's perfect for you. Uh, obviously, he filled in all the blanks for me, and uh, I then went and uh, auditioned, and uh, after about, I think they went through about 25 drummers, I got the gig. Let's talk about uh, Judge Mercy a, a little bit. So Judge Mercy seemed to have all the ingredients for success, strong original and catchy tunes, great musicianship, media support and right from the get-go the band was incredibly hard working uh always playing live and earning its stripes as a powerhouse live band and from my from my memory pretty much the house band at springfields you must have a lot of great memories from that period of your life yeah sure do mate i mean it, it was uh it was something we all were very proud of and, and and you know we prided ourselves on being the best we could as you say we had a lot of uh, support within the industry uh, we did lots of work. I think from memory in one year, I think we did close to like 320 shows, mm. um, <clears throat> which was, you know, no mean feat in those days. No. But um, yeah, but Springies was a, a great home and a base for us. In fact, it was the only gig where we actually sort of made money because um, it was like a, a door deal type thing and we'd do two nights there. Um, anything else was just, you know, money in the bank and putting it away towards the future of the band. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, the band's demise came um, through uh, management at the time and 
without going into it, we uh, could no longer perform as Judge Mercy. So the en- the entity of Judge Mercy was defunct, and we os- we tossed around the idea of restarting and, and coming up with another name, but we just thought it was all too hard. So unfortunately, that was the demise of the band. Okay, and on I think on um, show number forty, I had uh, Andy Seashell on the show, and he mentioned that most of the songs on that Judge Mercy album were songs he had penned for a Rose Tattoo album, post beats from a single drum that never eventuated. And there's a lot yeah. of great tunes on the Protocol So Holy album that still stand up. Songs like Open Season yeah. and Bury Me Down. W- what are your memories, yeah. mate, of that six-week period oh, mate, um, recording that album? As I say, like when I first got a copy of the songs for the actual auditions, I, I, I was blown away with just the, the, the songmanship and, and the, the actual production. I thought, geez, this this really is good and obviously as time went on I, I knew of Andy's um, you know whereabouts and what he'd done he also played with Swanee for a while uh, prior to me and um, then he did the um, uh, Rose Tattoo thing uh, he actually co-wrote I think there was a song um, well there is a song called um, uh, oh, I forget now <laughs> I can't think what it is, but it was actually penned, as you say, for Rose Tattoo. Angry wrote the lyrics, but it didn't make it, so we uh, ended up changing it a little bit and making it our own. It was actually going to be the first single, but um, it was deemed not to be really uh, indicative of of what the band was doing at the time. So it got on the album, but it it, it never made it as a single. Hmm. That's interesting. Now, I Give the Young Tomorrow, so that's the name of the song, Give the Young Tomorrow. Well, I think a, a lot of the Judge Mercy songs have a feel, uh, you know, a groove and a swing that separated uh, the band from a lot of their peers, but the band seemed to be pushed as a metal band. You know, would you agree with that? And, and was the label yeah. interest in the band aside from Massive Records? Most definitely. Uh, um, it was sort of we. It was sort of hard to pigeonhole the band because we weren't really cool enough for Triple J at the time um, and we were probably too heavy for for Triple M at the time. So, mm. um, and then as you say, we got classes as, as, you know, a metal band where really we were just a, a hard rock and blues band, really. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but everyone likes to put labels on things of why I don't know. But anyway, that's the way it is. October 1991, the band opened up for ACDC in Brisbane and Sydney. Uh, what are your memories yep. of that tour, mate? Awesome, mate. Uh, it was great. We actually got to meet the guys. And hung out with them. We did uh, three Sydney shows and uh, two Queensland shows. Um, they used different bands in different states, but we were the, the band that they used the most out of the whole tour, which we were quite chuffed with. Mm. Um, yeah, they were great memories, mate. They hold them close to my heart and, and my mind, of course. They're, um, we actually, uh, Brian Johnson, we were doing a show. They were still in, in Australia at the time. We were doing a show at Salinas with, uh, you know, there was Jimmy Barnes, um, and I think the Screaming Jets from memory. Um, there was, it was about a four band bill. We were, we were second band on and, and Brian actually came to the gig and, and saw us, which was good. You know, great. Nice to hear. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I, uh, I recall seeing the band many times, including that show at DY Hotel around May of 91, which was recorded and yep. released as the live EP. But I also remember the band playing a pretty phenomenal set at the Horden supporting Iron Maiden in 1992. Yep. Uh, again, what are your memories of support, supporting Maiden? I think that was on the Fear of the Dark tour. That's right. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, we did Sydney and Melbourne. That, that were the only two shows they did mm. in Australia at the time. Um, yeah, they were great. I mean, you know, obviously Iron Maiden fans are very staunch and... We actually were, were received quite well, especially in Melbourne, which we hadn't had a lot of luck in Melbourne prior to that. But that seemed to sort of open the doors for us in Melbourne after that show. So, yeah, we owe a lot for that. But, yeah, they were, they were great shows and, and great fun. It's always great to play those sort of, you know, gigs where, you know, there's a lot of people, big production and, mm. yeah, a lot of fun. Did, um, I think from memory, the band also supported Ian Gill and Megadeth, did they not? Uh, Megadeth, uh, we were going to, but that got cancelled for whatever reason. Uh, but yeah, we did uh, a pub tour with um, Ian Gillen and his band, which was awesome. We spent a lot of time together on the road and, and many drunken nights together and <laughs> a, a lot of fun. 
So post Judge Mercy, you move on to working with Pete Wells and one gig with him, uh, which stands out in my memory, and that was in 1995, I think, upstairs at the Lansdowne Hotel on Broadway, and you were playing uh, with Pete Wells and Andy in a band called Romeo Dog. Did you tour Europe with Romeo Dog? We we, we toured, um, me and Andy toured with uh, Pete and Lucy in uh, Europe, um, and Andy that uh, was part of Romeo Dog from New York. He came mm. over and we recorded the Romeo Dog there and we uh, did a film clip and we did uh, one show together uh, in, in Frankfurt, actually, um, which was great. But that's as far as it went, as far as the Romeo Dog thing. But, you know, still people still ask for it. Just recently um, I did a show in, in, in Perth. I was with Rose, actually, in a, a thing called Raise the Flag for the Bond Scott. Mm. Um, memorial and there were a lot of uh, German folks there and uh, I signed a few copies of the Romeo Dog thing which was quite pleasing so that well, was it's great a really, it's a really really good album yeah yeah I mean we just knocked that up pretty much we had two days off I think it was over a weekend a, a Sunday and a Monday and uh, we found this studio or we, we were um, told to try this studio which we did and, and yeah as I say we did it in two days so we were pretty chuffed for that Okay, so um, sometime moving on in 2005, you replaced Paul DeMarco and the Tats and did a bunch of shows here and also yep. in Europe, including an outdoor show in Germany, I think, to about 150-odd thousand people. Great memories yeah, of that Yeah, that was tour. massive. Yeah, mate, that was a great tour. It was hard work. Um, we did, did like a three-week run uh, around Australia, and then we headed over for, I think we did, I think it was like 25 shows in 30 days. And it was stinking hot over there. Uh, we did that show, that 140,000, I think it was, um, mm. was a band called Boz Uncles. And they were quite a, quite a, um, they were left sort of band, left wing sort of band and very, um, very, but just self-promotion. They had no, they didn't go on MTV or anything like that. They were very self-promoted and, um, that was their final show, and um, it ran over two days. And bands like um, Motorhead and a few others played there as well. So yeah, we did that show. It was just amazing. We've never done anything like that before or since, actually. So yeah, and great memories of that. Coincidentally, as many of our listeners will know, Tattoo are in Europe and Germany at the moment. Apparently, absolutely at the moment, slaying yeah. them. Yep, yeah, slaying them. Yeah, doing well. Yeah, boys are doing great. Flying the flag really well, which is great to see and hear. Yeah, I, I believe they're actually going to the States next year as well, which is good, good to see. Yeah. Um, they haven't been over that way since, well, since I think pretty much since... Um, 82, something like that? The Life album, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay, I now, that goes well for them. I have heard that you came very close to replacing Phil Rudd in ACDC. Is that correct? Did you audition? Yes, it is, mate. It, it's not a, it's not a, not a rumour. Um, it was... It was Obviously, it had to be kept quiet, which was killing me at the time. <laughs> um, I knew it sort of went on for about three months, and uh, it was over a Christmas period actually. And um, the funny thing, thing I, I thought that um, Simon would have jumped, Simon Wright would have jumped straight at it because they asked him, but he he declined. Um, and then. Um, Basically, with people on the inside, I sort of knew what was going on, and, and um, there's an actually uh, actual uh, Australian guy by the name of Noel Rush who has been overseas for quite some time now. He does a lot of tour managing. He's actually um, he was tour managing uh, ACDC in the Rock or Bust and the one prior to that, and uh, yeah, he sort of had the ear to the ground for me and uh, was keeping me in the loop and. You know, and then he let it known to be that um, they ended up keep going back with Chris Slade, which I saw, I sort of get, you know, mm. out of the devil, you know, I guess. Sure. But yeah, so it was nice to be the, it was nice the, to be uh, thought of. How did the audition uh, take place? How did it all come about? It, it wasn't actually an audition. It was just um, my hat. My pretty much my my name was thrown into the hat, and obviously they they knew of me because of um, you know us supporting him back in the day, in the early 90s. Um, and uh, they, they said, yeah, he's definitely uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the hat, so to speak. And when uh, um, Angus came out for Christmas, um, it was known to me then that they were going to go with um, 
Chris Slade. But, yeah, there was no actual audition process, but, yeah, I was considered. In January of this year, you played uh, live with Richie Sambora and Orianthi in their outfit RSO. That's right, yeah. Is the yep. door still open to keep working with them? I believe so, mate. Yeah, we, we left on good terms. Unfortunately, that tour was cut short. We were supposed to do eight shows. Uh, we ended up only doing three. Richie was a um, lovely bloke. You know, he doesn't need to blow wind up people's arseholes, but he, he said, mate, you, you kicked my ass. And he said, he said you did great. Because we only had two days rehearsal and off we went sort of thing. But um, he uh, said, mate, when I, when I do Asia... Um, we'd like to use you and, and obviously when we come back to Australia. So, yeah, fingers crossed. But again, your busy schedule could be even busier. Well, yeah, it could be, mate. But again, you know, now I've just heard that um, now they're talking about maybe doing a Bon Jovi reunion now. Hmm. That's what I've heard. So. Okay, makes mate. Sense. I reckon I've racked your brain enough and uh, I've got to thank you for your time. You've had a great journey from behind the kit, one which continues on. And it's been great to look over some of your history. We've yeah, got no, you this week, and I think that the um, the bits are released, which I've got in my hand here. Pedigree Mongrel is um, set that's to right. release tomorrow. That's tomorrow, isn't tomorrow, it? yeah, tomorrow, yeah. yeah, that's right, yeah, tomorrow. So it's very that timely. Was, um, yeah, I mean, um, and again, we we thank you for your review that you did a couple of months ago. It's um, it's turned out a lot better than we thought. We um, we did a a, a bunch of songs like. Uh, uh, an EP, I think, which you know about, which is just self-titled Bitsa. Yep. Um, and then we thought, well, let's do it again, you know. And um, we actually pre-recorded a few songs when we did the uh, the, the EP, uh, and they sort of just got stuck in the vault. And um, then we said, all right, let's 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 do some more. So we um, ended up doing the full album, which um, sounds great. I'm really happy with. We're all really Any, happy uh, with. Any plans to play live from from Bits? It's funny you say that. We we're actually been talking about that the last few weeks. Um, it's pretty hard, obviously, because of logistics with everyone. Because mm. um, now there's quite a few mouths to feed with that band. Um, but uh, we are toying with the idea of maybe doing some shows at the end of this year or early next year. That's uh, so that's we'll pleasing, keep posted. Pleasing to hear. Yeah. Mate, every yeah. guest, no, every great. guest on the show gets to select a song by an Australian band. Something which has significance to you uh, can be one of yours. What would you like to choose and why? Oh, that's hard. Uh, I'll, well, if it's going to be one of mine, I, I think, mate. I, I, I'm so proud of you know, obviously the Judge Mercy thing, but I think you know, and while we're while we're in the in the now, I'll, I'll say Rose Carlio, and I'll, I'll I'll go with either Battle Scars or. Um, probably into the fray. Okay, why don't we close out? I'm I'm going to split you there. I'm going to go with into the fray. How's that? Sounds good, mate. Wonderful. Let's close out with that. And uh, thank you for your time today, mate. I really appreciate having you on the show. No, thanks for having me, mate. And thanks for all your hard work and 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 your kind words. And and keep it up, mate. We need more people like you. <laughs>